Caruso is a name like whoa yeah and she is right up there with with Caruso what made her take off when she uh, came to the United States of America and started singing at the Metropolitan Opera in New York City well it was just her astounding talent she came she was 25 years old the opening night of the Met was uh, Faust and it was a big event and all but the second night was Lucia de Lammermoor the opera that Marcella Sembrick had been recognized in in London she was such a sensation there that um, she was brought to America to sing at the new Met and uh, <clears throat> but interestingly what happened that first season of the Met we had the Metropolitan Opera newly opened and the Academy of Music by uh, run by Hammerstein uh, Oscar Hammerstein not the lyricist that we know but but I believe his father or maybe his mm-hmm. grandfather I'm not sure that how far sure. back it goes but <clears throat> two competing opera companies and they in a way they overspent each other and as a result uh, Italian opera that is the style of bel canto singing that Maricela Sembrick sang uh, it enabled it allowed for as you call it a prima donna it allowed for the star treatment of the lead soprano and mm-hmm. by that I, I I don't mean that you know she doesn't want, want any blue M&Ms or anything sure. I mean that it gives the artist a certain freedom with the conductor to put little trills and extra little bits of music into and she has a certain she commands certain things but what happened is after that first season the opera because of necessity and because of the budget they switched to a German approach and without getting into the whole technical things of the difference between Italian opera and German opera uh, suffice it to say that German opera was a style of opera singing that Sembrick really didn't do so after the first season she went back to Europe for a time continued her studies but interestingly before she went back in 1884 in, in the spring of that year before firing the the, the the fellow who who Mr. Abbey who whose initial venture didn't work they allowed him to have a, a benefit to try to recoup some of his losses and that was one of the rare occasions where Sembrick not only sang these opera arias but also played piano played violin she astounded everyone it was written that Sembrick shone like a star uh, shone like a meteor in a galaxy of stars and that was 1884 and it wasn't until 1898 when she came back to the Met for that last decade that's when she sang opposite Caruso all these other more familiar names perhaps to us today now how did uh, we end up having this uh, opera museum which uh, is open to the uh, general public in uh, Lake George interestingly you know getting back to just the people being there right at the right time. Marcella Sembrick had a daughter-in-law, Juliette de Cape, who was who adored Madame Sembrick and who very lovingly looked after her in her last years uh, after her husband died. How, how old was she when she passed away? She was nearly 77, 76 oh, and 11 months, yes, yeah. And that was in 1935. Uh, but uh, it, it was her daughter-in-law that took the teaching studio that Marcella Sembrick had built for her students from Juilliard and Curtis. Both those music conservatories had voice departments founded by Marcella Sembrick. Uh, so when she moved to Lake George in the summers, she wanted a place for her students to study, which is why on the site of the boathouse, on this beautiful 14-acre estate, she had the teaching studio built. She used it as such from 1924 to 1934. After she died in 1935, her daughter-in-law, uh, and it was the middle of the Depression, there, weren't, there wasn't a lot mm-hmm. of money around, she uh, spearhead, spearheaded an effort to preserve the four acres and beautiful idyllic forest land and the teaching studio as a memorial to Madame Sembrick. It opened in 1937 and we're so fortunate that she went out, you know, she she made the effort to do this because we still have it there today all these years later. The rest of the property out out of necessity, property values were low, it was the middle of the depression, were partitioned off and sold 
but luckily those four pristine acres of forest land are still there. The little studio where she taught, filled now with all the loving cups and memorabilia from this astounding career. Autographs from Rachmaninoff, Verdi, Puccini, Mark Twain, Thomas Edison, all these people that she knew and were part of her life are there for the for the uh, visitor to, to see today. Now one, one of the uh, problems we have here in uh, New York State is the economy. Yeah. And not-for-profits are finding that federal, state, uh, private grants are not there like they used to be. And also people are doing more staycations, which in some ways could impact an organization like yours where you're you still have a good attendance but it's more locals and people out of town how do you guys stand right now under and this economy with all of those factors well we're fortunate to have a really loyal following and uh, uh, membership because we're a membership organization run by a board of directors and so we're able to uh, keep going and trying to offer more. We're, we're expanding into the winter months. Uh, I mentioned earlier about this whole amazing new technology that brings operas on movie screens. Uh, we're working right now with the Met in the next few years to try and bring those uh, those HD transmissions up to Glens Falls, possibly to the Wood Theater. Right. That's something in pro process. So. Uh, to answer your question, I think what we want to do is make people aware of Marcella Semberg, of the museum, of who we are, so that we can continue to, to uh, try to grow our membership base. Now, what do you think makes your museum special? And also, within that, if someone is uh, in grammar school, uh, high school or college, and they uh, sort of consider themselves an amateur opera singer. Do you think that going to your museum would help them? In particular, if they come the second week of June every year, we have a young person's showcase open to all people uh, in the capital region and beyond, young singers. So that we, we try to have performance opportunities such as this for the older singer, we were starting uh, master classes, most recently with uh, this group newly formed out of Albany, an uh, intensive trainer singer founded by Heidi Skok called Resonance. So we're trying to do things, educational outreach, we're, uh, so there is a lot in terms of what any individual can get from the museum. But to get back to your first question, what makes our museum special, if you'll allow me to maybe uh, Bragg, re refer, of no, not me, uh, to refer to the when we uh, were placed on the National Register for Historic Places. Congratulations. To, uh, well, yeah, and it was, thank you, and it was through the efforts of volunteers who, uh, I didn't realize how extensive and hard it is, how difficult it is to fill out the application and all the, the documents that you need for it, but this was several years back. They, they all worked together. They, they got approval for us to be on the National Register, but one of the judges or, or people who who consider the application commented that it's not just the amazing studio and everything that's inside. It's not just the pristine forest and the, it's like a nature preserve, it's not just that, but it's the combination of the historic building on the beautiful uh, unspoiled piece of property that makes it special. And I would say that today. I would say someone who doesn't want to deal with opera. You know, let's say you had a stressful day, you don't want to hear a, a prima donna singing. Mm -hmm. Well, come, just come walk the grounds, because you'll find uh, this short path along the lake. I mean, I know it's a cliche when, when uh, you market something, say it takes you back in time, but literally it does. I don't know other way, other way to put it, because these paths that were part of the lake landscape in the 20s, uh, are still there, the past that she walked, uh, and it's so 
peaceful and tranquil to be able to walk along the lake. That's one frustration. I don't know how it is in the other lakes of the capital region and beyond, but uh, sometimes when you're going up and down the lake, you'll notice uh, new property moving in, and the first thing that goes up is this huge fence. You know, right. Uh, you know, Privacy barring, fence. barring you, uh, the, the, the driver or the walker from getting a, a view of the lake. Well, this is one of the few spots on Lake George where you really have the prime view of the lake 